Jimmy, thanks for taking the time to come on the show. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, Andrew. So, um, Jimmy, I want to, again, thank you as a, a longtime Jags fan. Um, you've brought us so many you know, great memories uh, throughout the, the mid-90s uh, with just some of the great plays um, and, and, and touchdowns and just memories. So I want to thank you again for that. Well, it was my job, man. I'm, I just appreciate uh, that I was able to provide some entertainment for you and some excitement in your life at the time. It was exciting for me to be able to, and an honor to be able to play in the NFL and, and also an honor to be able to play in such amazing fans that we have in Jacksonville. It was uh, one of the greatest times of my life. I wish I can go back to the day and redo them. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, man. Thanks thanks again. Um, so I want, I want to you know talk a little about that infamous play uh, in the the, the uh, playoff game in '96 against the Broncos, Brunel throws that touchdown pass to you uh, in the back of the end zone. It's always a play that really stuck out in my mind. I just wanted to kind of pick your brain and and uh, kind of get some of your thoughts about how that was. Well, I mean, we we were on a drive, and Mark Brunel had made this amazing thirty yard run to get us within field goal range. Being that we were playing the great John Elway, we knew that that you know he was known for having fourth quarter comebacks. Um, I think we were we were up by a touchdown, maybe I, I can't remember what the score was, but we we needed a touchdown, not just a field goal because he he was going to go down and, and put them in position to score, which he did. So we knew that we had to get the ball in the end zone at that time. Uh, it was a uh, we ran the ball after after that amazing run by Mark Brunel. We ran the ball a couple of times, didn't get the first down. It was it was about third and five or third and six, and ball was uh, I think the ball was at the twenty or sixteen or something like that. And uh, I tell you, you know, we stepped into the huddle and and they called uh, they sent in one of our bread and butter plays, which is you know is a pro pro. Pro red right X read, which which uh, I lined up on the left side. I always went opposite of the call, so I, it was pro red right, and I went to the left. And I knew who I was lined up on. I had been going against Tory James for the Broncos all game, and uh, not getting many attempts the, the entire game. So he was he knew that, and he he figured you know the defense that they were in, they knew that we probably would not wasn't going to throw the ball at that particular time in the game. And uh, they just, you know, the the entire game, they had been in a cover two coverage, you know, because me and Keenan, we we lit it up that year. I led the league in third down catches. and Keenan was uh, headed to the Pro Bowl. So they were afraid of our passing game. But being that we weren't throwing the ball as we normally do, uh, they decided to 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 line up in in a cover cover three press with one safety in the middle, and uh, a, a couple of series before, earlier, Steve Atwater, the the All Pro Hall of Fame safety, uh, had gotten hurt. He had a thigh bruise, so he was out of the game. But we continued to run the game, and our offensive coordinator Kevin Gilbrights noticed that he wasn't in the game and they had one single safety and he called that play. And I remember, you know, getting that play, receiving that play from Mark in the huddle and Mark looked at me and said, Jimmy, if you get press, I'm coming to you. And we we knew that we probably wouldn't get the, the coverage, the press coverage with the single high safety because we hadn't got it the whole entire game. And I went out to line up and uh, Tory James was in my face. And I didn't even notice the safety I, I, because, you know, I just didn't think the ball was coming to me. But he was on me press, so I was going to do my best job to, to run, you know, to run the route that I ran the best, which was the go route. And and Mark was, you know, he, he gave – I could kind of see his eyebrows go up, like, this is it. And uh, that's – when he did that, that's when I noticed – I looked down in there and didn't see a safety. Right. And I knew the ball was coming to me, and uh, I, I got a great release on Tory James. Uh, I tried to make it seem like I wasn't going to get the ball. That that that's that's what made the play. I came off the ball, you know, fairly decent, but I made it seem like the ball was not coming to me until the last minute. I, I burst for about three to five yards, 
and uh, stretched out and, and made a diving catch just beyond his beyond his uh, his fingertips. You know, I was able to to uh, undercuff him, get my shoulder up under his underarm, and move his arms out the way, and uh, I had a clear pass to the ball. And uh, I just had to make an easy catch. It was a perfect throw from Mark Burnett. Yeah, it was it was an amazing play, and I'm just kind of curious. Do you have any other moments like that where you, just memorable Jag moments throughout your career? Yeah, uh, you know, playing Baltimore in the year 2000, the year that Baltimore won the Super Bowl, they were considered uh, the next second best defense in NFL history after the '85 Chicago Bears defense third game of the season, or it may have been the second game of the season, but uh, we went up there. Uh, with no running game, Fred Taylor was out, was not playing that game. So we had our backup running backs in the game. So they knew we had to throw the ball. And uh, I just happened to have a field day, not going into the game thinking I was going to have a day like that. But, you know, they they were so good up front with their front seven, having Ray Lewis and, and company up there, we just could not run the ball. So we were forced to throw it. And uh, I got 21 attempts, and I caught 15 balls out of those 21 attempts. Nice. And uh, for for a total of 291 yards and three touchdowns, and uh, you know that was my 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 best performance in my NFL career. The only unfortunate thing is that we lost the ball game. We lost the ball game by three points. You know, Baltimore got the ball. You know, with about a minute and forty some seconds left, and drove down, threw a post route over the middle to Shannon Sharp for a touchdown. And they beat us. But I mean to to still put up those numbers against the you know that defense is just incredible. So uh, you know, hats off yeah. to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, I look back on it today and I, I'm, I'm still in amazement. You know, because back then I was so programmed and so prepared to go out there and not think, just just do my job to the best of my ability. And now that I reflect on it, as I'm retired. You know, I, I I pull up on YouTube all the time and, and, and put that game on. I'm just like, man, I did that. I mean, that was actually me against this defense. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> so I'm still in a maze of what I could do myself on that particular day going against that particular defense. Yeah, I mean, and it, it seemed like, you know, you had a great relationship with quarterback Mark Brunel. Um, you guys really just gelled well. Um, do you see that kind of now with Gardner Minshew and DJ Chark? No, no, no not at all. Not at all. No. Okay. Not even close. Not even close. I know uh, it's a little. I know it's yep. a little early, <laughs> but uh, you know. Well, uh, the 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 only similar thing is that they they have an opportunity to grow together. You know, right. DJ was drafted uh, three years ago. Minshew was drafted two years ago. So there, me and Mark came in the same year, which was 95 and we became starters in, in 96. He became a starter, uh, you know, the first, the first week of 96 and I became a starter, uh, the eighth game of, of 1996. So we, we kind of grew together. Now, even though he was a starter, I would, you know, Andre Risen was, was, was the starter then, and they just could not get on the same page. And we would notice that the offensive coordinator and Tom Coughlin would send me in as the third receiver, but I wouldn't go in as the third receiver. I would go in and line up as the number one receiver, and they would move Andre Risen to the third receiver spot on third downs. And by doing that, I became the number one target. I was a starter without being a starter, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. And I was able to lead the entire NFL in third down catches that year. And, and you know, you mentioned Tom Coughlin. I was just kind of curious, uh, what was it like, you know, playing under Tom Coughlin? Because I could hear, you know, I heard some rumors that some of the, the, the training camps could be intense. But uh, I just wanted to kind of pick your brain on that. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's exactly. I mean, all of us complained, you know, because we thought it was a little bit you know, overboard, but we needed that. You know, you had guys coming from different teams, uh, free agents from everywhere, you know, in 95, and that training camp was tough because he was trying to get us uh, to play like he wanted us to play, which was, you know, tough, disciplined, um, uh, in shape, you know. Uh, and, and I said discipline, but discipline will probably be the number one thing. Playing, being a disciplined team and playing together, and being a strong team in the fourth quarter, 
we didn't realize that during you know during the course of our training camps and our practices because we practice hard. Some days we practice six days straight, two a days. Well, now in the NFL with the collective bargaining, they're not allowed to do that. They only they never practice two a days, two days straight. It's it's a two a day on a Monday, then a one a day on a Tuesday, then they may be off on Wednesday. Right. So it's so it's pretty much like a country club now. They didn't they don't put in the work that we used to put in put in back then. And I'm sure before our time it was probably even rougher than that. You know, Coach Coughlin was an old school mentality type coach. And, you know, now that I look back on it, that's exactly the type of coach that we all needed back then because you know what happened? The results were we put wins in win column. Right. Right. So um I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the corners that you faced in uh, in your career, and was just kind of curious what were some who were some of the best, or who was the best corner that you ever uh, faced uh, during your NFL career? Well, the best corner I ever faced, and I only faced him twice during my career, was Deion Sanders. Once when he was with uh, Dallas, and once when he was with the Redskins. I only caught two balls on him uh, out of those two games. Um, I would say the second best corner would, would be a toss up between Ty Law from the New England Patriots and Sabari Roll from the Tennessee Titans. Uh, uh, and I think the third best would probably be Adam Pac Man Jones. They gave me a lot of trouble also. Gotcha. So uh, I would say those four corners would probably be, would probably be the ones who gave me the toughest times during my, my NFL career, but definitely Deion Sanders would be the top. He, he was, an amazing athlete. I've never seen a guy as fast as him. Uh, you know, I've never seen a human being run as fast as that guy. <clears throat> On the deep balls, you know, deep balls for my specialty. You know, he would line up out, outside shoulder, which he did a lot of game planning. He studied my film, and he knew to take away the the way he was going to take away the deep ball was to play the outside shoulder and stay on top of it. A couple of times they called the deep ball and Deion Sanders, you know, mark overthrew me on purpose and Deion Sanders ran past me and almost caught up to the ball. Wow. And that amazed me. That amazed me to see that type of speed. And immediately when that happened, I was like, I'm not going deep today. I mean, that was out of the question. So I was busy trying to figure out, okay, what else could I do on this guy? Well, I figured out during the course of the game that Dion was susceptible to all inside routes because he played outside shoulder and uh, he wasn't the best tackler. In fact, he hated tackling. He hated being blocked. He would, a lot of times he would just let me block him. If Fred was running the ball to my side, he would let uh, let me block him just so he wouldn't have to tackle Fred. So with the run game, we could, we could beat Deion Sanders. We could, we could take advantage of him and any inside route, like the slant, the curl or the in route, Deion Sanders would not follow you across the middle. So those would be the two only two weaknesses against Deion Sanders. It would just matter if your offensive coordinator would call those routes right. and run the ball to your side. Right. So what about like the best corner that you practice against? Would that would that would that have been Aaron Beasley or? Yeah, I would have to say that that was Aaron Beasley because you know he was a big corner, six one, two hundred and some pounds, the same size as. As I as I was, uh, strength wise, he was in the weight room, so he was strong. Uh, he, he wasn't a he wasn't a burner, but he was strong at the line of scrimmage. Where I took advantage of defensive backs, you know, I was in the weight room and I had a lot of power and strength with the speed. You know, I was able to just manhandle them, gr- grab them at the line. I would I would go at the DB, grab them, and move them out of the way instead of them. Uh, jamming me, so I would take it. Always take it to the DB. But in practice, uh, I have to I have to give it to Aaron Beasley because he prepared me uh, to go out and, and beat up on some of those corners. And at the same time, it helped me become the best receiver that I could possibly be. And going against a guy like that and competing against a guy like Aaron Beasley in practice every day. Yeah, you, you mentioned that you you know you were physical off the line. Um, you know, do you feel like there's less kind of physicality now and, and uh, with the, the refs in the NFL and pass interference calls. Yeah. Yeah. With the rule changing now, I would probably have 2000 yards a season because you can't hit a receiver over the middle. We always had to worry about that. Even though Keenan ran most of the middle routes, he was masterful in there. 
as far as maneuvering and sitting down in holes and and uh, and and not allowing a defensive player to get a hit on them. Um, these players don't have to worry about that. They know that they're probably not going to get hit. If they do, the player is going to get thrown out the game, and the player is not going to risk that or 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 risk to get thrown out for their team. So that's one thing. And then you know, you know, halfway through my career, they put the five yard head chuck rule in, where you know you couldn't touch a receiver. You know, you, they're only allowed to touch a receiver with you know within the five yards. So I took advantage of that rule. I was able to to take advantage of the five yard tug rule because after five yards they couldn't touch us and I was able to do a lot of damage. But before that rule, it made it tough on receivers. I mean, you get mauled all the way down the field and you get your head knocked off if you went over the middle. So with the rule changes, you know, I would love to play in today's game because I knew I wasn't going to get those big hits and I knew I was going to be able to run down the field, <clears throat> run down the field freely. <laughs> So, yeah, so I, I want to segue a little bit into the Jaguars wide receiving core. Obviously, it's pretty young. You know, you have Colin Johnson, you have LaVisca Chenault, and then, you, you know, you have DJ Chark. Uh, do you think that this wide receiving core has the potential to, to be a real serious deep threat this season? Well, they definitely have a coach in Keenan McCarter with that mentality, and I'm sure Keenan is, is installing that mentality. It's just a matter of those guys – take on that mentality from Keenan because we had a mentality that we looked for for those challenges. You know, we were going against a tough se- secondary. Um, we was welcoming that with open arms, me and Keenan was. Uh, it's just a matter if these type, if these receivers that you just named are those dogs, as Deion Sanders like to say, we got some dogs out here. <laughs> you got to have some, you got to have some dog in you at receiver. You just can't be a just wimpy guy out there on the sideline hoping to catch the ball. Yeah. You you must have you must have a linebacker mentality of receiver. Uh hopefully Keenan will you know, those guys are uh will take note from that and, and become those type of receivers and de- demand you know, demand uh double coverage. You know, demand see we if we got single coverage, we felt it was a disrespect because we were so used to used to seeing you know, cover two and two man. It was always a safety over the top of us. So when we did get a chance, we couldn't believe it. It was like unbelievable these guys leaving me one-on-one with a corner. Um, now these new guys, they have a lot of talent. I like them. I think they're exceptional route runners. Um, Chenault uh, and DJ Chark, both of them have shown toughness. I've, I haven't seen much of Colin, uh, but he's a, he's a big Six six guy, which he has the advantage. I can't wait for him to get his legs up under him and, and see him out there catching more balls and see what he's going to turn out to. But they do have potential. I'll leave it at that. These guys have potential to be something great. It just it's, it's going to be up to them. Yeah, I think you're completely right. I mean, uh, from what I've seen from Chanel, he definitely has the potential, like you said, to be a, to be a dog. You know, he's really physical, just kind of trucking people and, and kind of a multi uh, dimensional kind of wide receiver. He can run the ball too. So it's, it's really exciting to watch. Yeah. You can, you can line Chenault up at multiple positions. You can line them up in the slot. You can line them up at the wing. You can line them up outside on the perimeter. You can put them at running back. You, you can do a multitude of things with a guy of that statue with that speed and that strength and that attitude. Right. So I look, I look for the Jaguars, you know, in the weeks to come to start force feeding him the rock and seeing what he could do because they definitely, you know, with DJ Chark out the other night against Miami, I was looking for someone to step up. Uh, it seemed like they wanted Chris, uh, Chris Conley to be that guy to step up, and the, you know, the, the the balls that were thrown to him, I didn't see much effort, and I was highly disappointed in Chris Conley. And I'm just being honest. It's just me. I'm an honest guy, whether you like it or not. But I was very disappointed that he showed very little. He put very little effort into going after the football. And that affects your whole team. That affects your whole team. And uh, But hopefully uh, DJ Chalk will get back out there as a missed opportunity for Chris Conley. I don't know if he'll get another opportunity. But if he does, I hope to see something different in him. I'm hoping that DJ Chalk is back with some alt. Uh, D.D. Westbrook, I hope to see him get back into the the lineup and uh, 
So they got a nice core. It's just a matter of them having the opportunities. There's one other guy I'm leaving out. Oh, Keen- Keelan Cole. He's been a playmaker. Yeah. He's been a playmaker. I, re- I really like he He's got a lot of heart. Yep. Doesn't necessarily have the size or the speed, but he's got heart, yep. and that matters. Yeah, he's really made just a drastic improvement, you know, especially last season, and then uh, he's shown a lot of potential this uh, this season as well. So really excited to see what he can do. Yeah, I am too. So uh, I want to go back to Gardner Minshew again. Um, you know, I want to. I, I saw an interview that you did online, and you know, you had said that you thought Gardner Minshew uh, could be potentially the franchise quarterback for Jacksonville. I'm just wondering if if your opinion has changed at all after the Dolphins game uh, last Thursday. Well, the Dolphins came in with an outstanding game plan. Uh, Flores has that team playing hard. You know, when you play the Miami Dolphins, you're gonna you, you're gonna have to play hard in order to get a win. And they wanted that ball game more than the Jacksonville Jaguars wanted it. You can see the energy on the field. The Miami Dolphins had it. The Jaguars did not. They did not have the energy to win the ball game. Uh, like I mentioned earlier with Chris Conley, not putting in the effort of going to get some of those balls he could have got to. And uh, the Jaguars were just kind of flat. And when they, when the, when the Dolphins, with an outstanding game plan, uh, the Jaguar, they made the Jaguar defense look real bad. Um, you know, also with a couple of blown coverages, I saw zone coverages were blown. They had an outstanding game plan, and Fitzpatrick wanted it more than any anybody. Fitzpatrick has some pressure on him to perform. Gardner Minshew does it. You know, you got Tua just waiting in the wings and chomping at the bit to get out there. Those Miami Dolphin fans want to see Tua. And I think uh, so Fitzpatrick is on borrowed time right now. He's going to play his best, and by him playing his best, that's what that team needs because when Tua does get in there, he's going to just create this this jolt of energy for that whole team, and they, they want to start winning because they already play hard. Yeah. The Jaguars are just kind of feeling their way around, just trying to find out their identity now. Right. Uh, Gardner Minshew, I think he still has the potential to be a franchise quarterback. It's just we just you know it remains to be seen. Yeah. Uh, those those receivers still have some developing to do. They got to protect them on the offensive offensive line. The running game has got to, a lot of things have to happen in order for a quarterback to be successful and be a franchise quarterback. He has to have some help. He can't do it by himself. Right. For, for example, you look at Patrick Mahomes. He's got weapons everywhere. Yep. The running back, the receivers, the tight end, the offensive line is destroying people. Their defensive line with Chris Jones at nose guard, they're killing people. So he has all all this help around him. And then he has outstanding coaches with Andy Reid and an outstanding play caller and, and Eric B. Enemy. So he has everything, and he also has the money to go with it. So all he got to do is just go out and have fun. Yeah, you give you, you put Gardner Minshew on that Kansas City Chiefs team. I'm not saying he'll do what Patrick Mahomes is doing, but he'll be doing some amazing things. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Um, so the Jags play the Bengals on Sunday. What's your outlook for that game? You think the Jags could come away with a win? This is this is going to be an exciting game because Joe Burrow's. I'm really pulling for Joe Burrow's. They're zero three right now. But the throws that he's making are amazing. He's going to he's he's more like a Tom Brady. He's Tom Bradyish to me. Yeah, I really like his style of playing. Some of the throws that I, I've seen him make already are some amazing throws and some tight windows. And again, once they they build that team around him, since around Joe Burrow, Cincinnati is going to be they're going to have a, a a team to contend with pretty soon. It's it's coming, and you can see it coming. And they are hungry for a win, just like the Miami Dolphins were last week. And the Jacksonville Jaguars got to be ready. They got another hungry, winless team coming in. And if they don't have, if they're not sharp, they're going to lose this one. Yeah, I think they have to get to Joe Burrow. Like you know, he, like you said, he's going to be a threat and, and put pressure on him. And defense has to play better, or you know, the Bengals are going to come away with the W. You're right. I, right now, our defense is killing us. Our defense is killing us. You know, until we can put pressure on the opposing quarterback, get some turnovers and make some plays on defense, 
that team is going to remain flat because our identity within the last three years has been Saxonville. You know, we're known for getting sacks and picks and turnovers and the mentality on defense was roughneck. Yeah. You know, you, you know that you're going to be in a ball game. Well, we don't have that anymore. So what's going to be our identity now? Is yeah. it going to be, is that defense going to come back all of a sudden? If that defense come back, we'll be in good shape. Yeah. Or is it someone on the offensive side of the ball? Is our running game going to step up and start dominating like, like Tennessee's dump, uh, running game or like Cleveland Browns running game with Nick Chubb and, and Hunt, you know? Yeah. We gotta we gotta have someone else step up other than Gardner Minshew to give him some help. He can be an outstanding quarterback, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, they just need to take some of the pressure off of him, and I think uh, he'll do fine. You know, take get, go with the running game, or like you said, uh, defense has to step up. So, or or if not, you know, we, you got Trevor Lawrence sitting there next week, next year. You know, we have, we'll have a chance to get him, and the teams that are. That are, I mean, if the season was over now, the teams that would get the first and second and third pick would probably be teams that don't need a quarterback. We're talking about the Jets. We're talking about the Giants. We're talking about Cincinnati. All those teams just drafted a quarterback, so they, they're going to be trading down. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, you, you spoke a little bit about Keenan McCardell, uh, you know, your teammate. Um, he is not, you know, he's been the wide receivers coach, uh, for the Jaguars for a couple of years. And I was just kind of curious, Jimmy, uh, do you see yourself, uh, kind of following a similar, similar path and going into coaching? Mm, I, I was never interested in, in coaching because it was, you know, it's all, it's an all day long deal. You know, you're talking, you're talking 11, 12 hours a day. Yeah. And, uh, at this point in my life, being retired, being, you know, putting in 12 years, um, giving what I've given to the game, I wanted to, you know, spend my retirement raising my kids, being a father, being there for because I got five boys and two daughters. And, you know, I, I just couldn't bear the fact of being locked up in a film room watching film while my boys are, are looking around like, where's daddy? So, right. um, you know, I'm real conscious about you know the uh, the well-being of, of my little sons, and and they all have aspirations of hopefully becoming NFL players one day. We know how hard it is, but I support them. I think it's more important for me to to be supportive of my young kids rather than to be, for me to be locked up in a in a film room all day and and coaching right now. Uh, now. Um, I have expressed some interest in possibly coaching, but for me to dedicate everything and dedicate my life to it, I'm not there yet. And I think that would be unfair to, to any team that I, I would potentially coach. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, and you know what, family's everything, man. So I, I, I definitely understand you. And, and um, I just want to, I want to thank you again, uh, Jimmy, for taking the time to come on uh, the show. I really appreciate it. It's just been a blast talking to you. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you for having me on. 